Hey Bottom Pushers, my name is Nick and welcome back to the life and suffering of Sir Bronte. And we are ending our childhood and we are moving into juvenile or adolescence? What comes after childhood? I should know this, but I don't. Adolescence. Juvenile isn't a thing. Good. So as a quick recap, we have just received our lot so basically we got punished in the name of the gods because that's a thing good pleased about that um we tried to screw the system a little bit by grabbing the sword instead of kissing that instead of getting whipped which we did but then got whipped anyway so yeah there's that um but yeah now we're moving into adolescence and my plan is to burn this system down however i can i was growing up fast the school, the streets, and the whole wide world awaited me beyond the gate of my parents' house. Adolescence. You've lived in this world for eight years now. As you grow older, life grows more complex. The world of your childhood was limited to your house and family. But now that realm is expanding. It also includes your neighborhood, the nearby houses, streets of the ancient city of Anazot. A question now looms over you, growing more pressing with each passing year. What will your place be in the vast outside world? Few people in the Blessed Arknean Empire trouble themselves with this question. It is not within a man or woman's power to choose. Their destiny is predetermined by their birth and those who bore them. And yet, your peculiar birth granted you a choice. Your father is a man of nobility, a worthy example in matters of duty and honour. Your mother is a commoner of lowly estate, humility and patience made flesh, and your sky is ablaze day and night with the light of the shining pillar, the beacon of the clergy. Your back bears the mark of the lash. Will you accept the drudgery and suffering that is the lot of the lowborn? For your entire life? Or will you follow in the footsteps of your father and your father's father and fight for the right to serve the empire as a noble of the mantle? Perhaps you will follow the twin god's word and offer spiritual guidance to others. I'm not ruling that out. I'm not ruling out that guide because if I can, because I'm, I'm convinced that this whole lot of suffering, lot of nobility is a man-made construct. I refuse to believe that was word path down by the gods. If I can become part of the clergy and put a stop to it that way, then I will. The answer lies out there in the vast, terrifying world. What awaits you beyond the walls of your home? So, events that can happen to the Bronte family in this chapter. Gloria's secret. Ooh, Gloria, you naughty girl. A secret society? Ooh. <gasps> Forbidden love, eh? Stefan, you dirty dog. You join the blood tide of the Bronte family. Okay, so I'm already... Well, my ingenuity's no good for that at the moment. Mobility's no good for that. I'm halfway to that. And your younger brother, Nathan Bronte, receives a, spirit, a spiritual admonition from you. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, there's more. Matters of the heart. You experience your first romantic feelings and meet a girl. Revelation of the Tree. You experience a revelation by the Sacred Silver Tree and Sophia Save. You save a local girl named Sophia from Lesser Death. Okay. That one could go hand in hand from from get a girlfriend. She's gonna fall in love with me if I save her from death, right? That's how it works. Right? Let's go. The boy down the street. The family expects more and more of you as you grow up. The teachers and tutors hired by your father keep you on your toes all the time. Your life these days is dedicated to studying for your future, for the future of the Bronze family. Your younger brother Nathan keeps growing up too. He can hold a conversation. You never refuse him when he wants to play, provided you have a bit of free time between your demanding lessons. It's a rainy day today. 
father and mother have gone to a ball, and they left Nathan in your care. You lose track of time over books in the sitting room, and Nathan goes off alone to splash in the creek. Soon you hear his voice begging you to come outside. He's on the porch, sobbing, all covered in dirt. You walk up to him as he continues to bawl. It's all, it's all that kid. He pushed me into the ditch and called me names. He said I was a fancy pants fool. I said I'll call my brother. He's still there. You have to go punish him, Nicklaus. Nathan points at a lopsided wooden house further down the street where the poorer artisans live. You see two boys lingering there on the porch. They're both clearly commons, but far from poor. One of them is almost as tall as Nathan, and he frowns in a funny way, just like him. The other looks older, almost your age, but he's more broad-shouldered and taller. His name is Thomas. You've heard it before. There, Nicholas, that's him! Nathan points at the younger boy and hides behind your back. Thomas grins and rolls up his sleeves to reveal strong forearms. He must have been helping his father with manual labour for quite some time. Listen up, rich boys. We don't give a damn about you or your friendship. We don't let nobody call our home a stinking rat hole. Your little brother earned his ditch dive. Maybe next time he'll dress normal and stop picking fights with people who can throw him in the mud. Your hands clench into fists before you react. Nathan called them names first. No wonder they did the same. That's how it goes. But pushing your brother into a ditch is too much. Thomas stands tall and confident. He sees no threat in you. You're about to get ready for a fight when you feel a tug on your sleeve. You turn your head to see Nathan, the one who started this whole mess. Come at Thomas and give him a beating. You simply have to teach that jerk a lesson. Say so your brother is to blame, resolve the matter peacefully. Okay, I'm going to try and resolve it peacefully because he is bigger than me. The quarrel can be resolved peacefully. You turn to Thomas and offer to solve the problem like adults. His brother will apologise to Nathan, and Nathan will apologise to him in return. There's no need to fight anyone, and you'll give Nathan a piece of your mind when you get home. You and Thomas are all grown up, and should act your age, you say. The blood rushes to Thomas's face when he hears this. Act our age, you say? Are you calling me a baby? You better shut your trap. This is all he says before he attacks. You barely dodge a fist flying at the face. You start trading blows, huffing and puffing with rage. The younger brothers gawk in awe at the sight. Thomas does not resort to fancy moves, dirty tricks or stupid taunts. He displays nothing but skill earned in many a string fight, and his heavy fists aim for your head. You keep dodging him again and again, trying to reach him. He takes a couple of glancing blows but easily shakes them off. What a bruiser. You start swinging your fists with greater and greater fury. Your heart is pounding like a hammer. You see nothing but the foe in front of you. How much longer will this take? You're worn out. Your breath grows ragged and your muscles grow heavy. But there is no way you can give up now. Nathan is watching you. Desperate and out of options, you swing and punch Thomas square in the nose. Then immediately let his fists smack you in the temple. The blow rings through your head like a bell and blinds you for a moment. The world swims before your eyes. You clutch at your head to get your bearings. Thomas is standing in front of you, blood dripping from his nose. You no longer want to fight it out, and it seems your opponent would rather end it too. But you keep standing there, eyeing each other angrily. Then suddenly, you hear an angry shout right next to you. An enraged man in a craftsman apron is shaking his fist. Thomas's face contorts into terror right away. That's my father. Run! The punishment for fighting is flogging, and the mere prospect of that makes you run like the wind. Thomas sprints in front of you. You dash across the rotten wooden planks of the back alley, up and over a lopsided fence, across a giant puddle in one leap, and then forward into the tall grass. You hide there and stay quiet. You hear no sound of pursuit. You exchange glances with Thomas and start laughing. His laughter is loud and infectious, but soon he cuts it short and grows sadder. Oh, I'm gonna get flogged anyway. My dad's always quick to give me a beating. And then he'll start nagging me about the lots and the prayers for days like he always does. Why do I always get myself mixed up in this stuff? But fighting's the only way to prove you're worth anything, right? The adults didn't see you fighting, you tell him. 
So all you have to do now is convince them you weren't. Nosebleeds happen, right? Mother gets nosebleeds all the time. Well, we could try it. Ah, let's hope our little brothers don't tell us. I'll talk to mine. There's a scratch on your head. Don't let them see it. Good thing I didn't hit you in the face. There, good as no. You assure him that Nathan will never tell. And in return, you'll make sure he behaves himself so he won't get tossed into a ditch again. With that, you shake hands with Thomas. His handshake is as strong as you'd expect based on his fists. You make your way out of the tall grass. You need to leave before Thomas' father goes to your family and complains about you breaking your lock. You come to a realisation on the way back. You had no idea the place you were hiding even existed. And it wasn't that far from home. Thomas smiles in excitement when he hears this. Oh, I know lots of places like this. I'll tell you what, if we get out of this mess today, I'll show you the way to the old fortress wall. It's the perfect place to build your own fort. I dragged a bunch of wooden planks there. Too bad it's no fun to build alone. My brother never helps me. He just gets in the way. You emerge from the muddy back alleys, united by a secret only the two of you know. It seems you've made a friend today. Nice. I made a friend. And all it took was some punches to the face. You made a friend. A boy named Thomas. I am nine. It's blistering hot today, even for the sun-parched lands of Magra. As soon as you're done with your studies, you dash outdoors and out of the stuffy room. You and Thomas roll up your shirt sleeves, but it barely helps. You would gladly go shirtless had you only been in the company of other boys. But there are three girls in the yard today. They're doing the laundry in a big wash tub, whispering and giggling. If you could, you would gladly keep watching one of them at work. She had big eyes of deep blue. Her dark hair is braided and her plain grey dress is mended and patched all over. Her name is Sophia. She throws her head back a little when she laughs. The rays of the sun are reflected in her eyes. You, Thomas and the other boys keep telling silly stories. Anything to make her laugh. You sure love telling tall tales, Nicholas. Oh, I remember this one time. But then Sophia hears a voice calling her home. She nods to you and runs across the street smiling. Her light steps carry her forward, but her eyes are looking elsewhere. Then a stone on the road catches her foot. She stumbles and falls flat into the dust. The street starts shaking from the thundering of hooves. Oh no. Riders appear on the road from around the corner. They bear a coat of arms you recognise right away. A sable serpent blade upon a field of dirt. It symbolises the Melanodas dynasty, the family of your province's archduke. The horses dash forward. A lost wooden toy on the road cracks under their hooves. They will not slow down. They are the nobles, and the rest must make way for them. Sophia is in their way, just now starting to get back on her feet. Her mother is crying for her desperately from behind the fence door. You freeze in terror. The riders surely see the girl. Are they going to stop? Or are they going to trample her? In only a few moments, the beautiful girl will be toppled, trampled, and crushed. Oh, no. Oh, my willpower. Why do I have no willpower? Because that's fully what I want to do. Oh, fine. I'll stay where I am then, I guess. No. You stand frozen by the roadside. Unable to look away as the cloud of dust covers the entire street, you feel as if a massive, maddened beast whipped into a merciless frenzy has just passed you by. You hear no screams, no cracking bones, nothing but the deafening din of the hooves. Ooh, there we are. Once the horses are gone and the dust settles, you can finally see the road again, and a repulsive blob of blood, flesh, and bone left on it. You can still see traces of Sophia in that mess, her dark hair, the remains of her dress. But it is no longer her. Sophia's earthly remains slowly dissipate and melt into the air. Her mother's eyes are filled with grief as she watches. She hunches over and slowly walks back into the house. You can still hear the riders far away down the road. None of them even bothered to look back. Your friends walk away. At a loss for words, you make your way home, dazed by what you've seen. 
You're still dazed as you retell these events to your mother, unable to look up from the floor. After a moment of silence, she embraces you and calms you down. Poor girl, what a terrible, painful death. But you must know that it was not her true death. By the twins' mercy, we are all given enough time in this world. Should you die before your time, you will be brought back by their grace. For three times they will rescue you from a terrible fate, but the fourth death is true and final for all. Every loss of a life we are granted at our birth is a heavy blow to us, but the gods told us not to mourn a lesser death. Everybody will keep on living as though nothing has happened, even Sophia's parents. Their family is poor, and they have no family crypt like we do. When the girl's soul comes back to life, her body will be reborn in a city church with all her wounds healed. Do not mourn her, my son, but thank the twin gods for their justice. You see Sophia by her house a few days later, and she looks completely fine, without so much as a scratch. The other children tell you that her parents now forbid her to leave the yard after dying such an early first death. You call out Sophia's name, she looks at you briefly, then walks back inside. Sophia never talks to you again. I wanted to save you, but I didn't have enough willpower. It's not my fault. I'm sorry. Well, I let my potential future girlfriend die. I guess that's on me. Fall, soil, and gunpowder. Sophia disappeared after the terrible incident with the horses. Her friends gossiped that her parents sent her off to serve a rich noble dynasty. You haven't seen each other since that day, but you still remember Sophia's eyes, the sunlight shining in them. But no matter what, life goes on. You're ten years old now. Your studies continue, and you're learning more about the land you live in. Anazoth is an ancient city in an imperial province by the name of Magra. All soil in Magra was turned to ash eons ago, scorched by magic during the rebellion of Duke Shah Malanavas. The magical arts are all but gone now, but the scorched earth has remained barren and infertile ever since. Since then, the entire province has lain barren, tormented by cold and scorched winds in equal measure, with few precious plants taking root on their own. All fertile land in Magra is bought elsewhere and brought here by an endless caravan of carts and carriages. To pay for food and soil, the cities of Magra became skilled in many trades, primarily mining and digging for metals and stone. Last fall there was an explosion just outside the city, followed by clouds of thick smoke. The first such incident frightened the citizens, but then explosions and smoke became an everyday occurrence. Soon, everyone just grew used to it. Father explained that the miners are using a new invention called gunpowder. It makes it easier for them to reach the precious stones and metals buried deep within the earth. Then one day, a thunderous explosion rocks the city, and black, billowing smoke covers the houses. People are stuck in their homes, all windows tightly shut. The air is impossible to breathe. Nathan coughs all the time. Gloria and you cough only when nobody's watching. If mother hears it, she'll make you inhale those hot, herbal vapours just like me. It takes two days for the black smoke to disperse. People pour out onto the streets to meet their friends. Thomas is eager to share everything he knows about the incident with you. They took lots of burnt up people to the city temple, Mum told me. She was helping the healers. There are many rumours. Some claim it was the work of a beast stirred from its slumber, while others say it was the surviving witches that continued to threaten the Order in the Empire with their accursed powers. But as for you, you patiently wait for Father to come back home, and then you'll ask him about it. Father spends day and night working at the prefecture while Mother spends all her time in prayer. It takes a full week for Father to finally come home, and he's almost completely spent. You muster enough courage during dinner to ask him what happened outside the city. Father raises his head, his face a bleak, weary mask, and starts muttering his proclamation. It's almost as if he doesn't see. It's the mine outside the city. They were trying to get a vein of ore. There was an explosion. The mine caved in, and the black smoke started flowing. Many workers died there. It was all because Count El Velasco, who owns the mines, 
wanted them to start mining that vein before they were ready. Some of the workers weren't even reborn. Perhaps the twins thought their final time had come. The prefecture has been inundated with complaints from families who have lost their breadwinners. Asking the judges for help, many people also lost their cattle to the black smoke. Count El Velasco blames gunpowder for the disaster. The prefecture and the newspapers just repeat whatever he says, but it's plain old greed and tyranny of the noblemen that are to blame. Why the welfare of our province is always paid for with commoner lives? Then, without warning, grow silence again. You keep thinking about it for days. Can your human life really end so easily? A single moment of bad luck and you die, only to re-emerge from a temple or the family crypt with a new black mark on your arm. Or worse, you remain where you fell, dead, never to be reborn. Ever. Mm. Stefan's arrival. During lunch, father tells you to stay home in the evening and prepare to meet some important guests. Your elder brother Stefan will return home by dinner tonight. Joining him will be your grandfather, Rega Brante, as well as a noble friend of the family. You're excited about your brother's return. It's been years since you last saw him. How has he changed during his years away from home? You and father await the guests anxiously. The doorbell rings. Three people are standing outside. Grandfather is the first to come in, naturally. He's not changed a bit since his last visit, still eyeing the house with contempt, looking for any reason to demean it. Grandfather is followed by a stately young man, dressed in a jacket embroidered in silver, whom you barely recognise as your brother. Stefan casts a glance at your threadbare clothing, your dirty fingernails, and smirks. Welcome home, you shitbag. The last to enter the house is a personable gentleman with a worn-out, wrinkled face. I've heard a lot about this man from father and grandfather. He is Baron Augustine Elbor, Stefan's uncle, a family friend, and the province's prefect, which means that he is the head judge and thus father's superior. Sir Elborn smiles lightly and offers you his hand. And this must be uh, your younger son Nicholas, yes? You have your father's eyes, young man. Father bows slightly to grandfather and Sir Elborn. But there's a moment of quiet when Stefan's turn comes. Father reaches out to him awkwardly, expecting an embrace. There is a question on Stefan's eyes as he looks at Grandfather. The old man shakes his head almost imperceptibly. We noblemen ought to put our emotions on public display, Father, not even after an empty separation. There is no embrace. Instead, Stefan nods to Father curtly. He responds in kind, his face devoid of emotion. After the greeting, you proceed to the sitting room. Elborn is the first to enter, kisses mother's hand, and Gloria's too, and tussles Nathan's hair after he sees him hiding by the table. Grandfather acknowledges them with a glum nod. Greetings, Lydia Bronte. Now I remember you were kind to me when I was a child. And you must be Nathan. You could barely walk when I saw you last. Your elder brother ignores Gloria completely. Not even a greeting. You proceed to the dining room in a dignified manner and take your seats. The dishes smell delicious, but they merely punctuate the overwhelming tension at the table. Elborn is the only one with a friendly smile on his face. Oh, this dinner is splendid, Lydia. Did you choose the dishes yourself? You have a truly refined palate. It warms my heart to know Stefan spent his early years with you. Womanly care always does a child good, no matter the estate. Your fork freezes in the air halfway to your mouth. You expect many things from a noble of the sword, but words of praise for a lowborn woman are not one of them. You cast a glance at Grandfather. He looks like he's about to choke on those words. It would do my grandson more good to stay at boarding school among his equals. Oh please, Gregor, parenting is no less important. Nothing can replace a mother's love. I cannot deny it. It saddens me greatly that my late sister could not be here to raise Stefan, but, but there was still a family for him, and he was surrounded by love. How could that be bad? And besides, his father was by his side all the while. A father's example is always the best, after all. Robert earned the judges rank the same way you did. Your grandson will surely follow in his footsteps, and who knows? Perhaps even the younger men of the Bronte family will contribute to the 
Oh, you clumsy lowborn cretin! Everybody is startled by this sudden outburst. Grandfather's face turns red. He is glaring at a young lady servant, holding a pitcher over a glass. Stefan is sitting right next to her, dabbing a napkin on a fresh stain on his jacket. Be gone this instant! The lady servant runs away, leaving the pitcher on a small table by the door. After a quiet moment, Elborn smiles again. Uh, it appears the servants have left us, yet dinner is far from over. Worry not, uncle. There are enough commoners at this table to keep us served with food and drink. Stefan glares at Gloria across the table. She's sitting right next to you. She shrinks down and hunches over under his gaze. Father furrows his brow. Mother covers her mouth with trembling hands. Grandfather sneers. Stefan's gaze does not move. The silence lasts far too long. Then she starts to rise from her chair. Bronte, gentlemen, so wish it. Your hands clench into fists under the table. How could he bring himself to humiliate his own family, his own mother and sister like this? It's all grandfather's doing. Stefan could not even bring himself to embrace father without his permission. And yet they're no one, and they have the right to act this way. If there is any way this dinner can become even more unbearable, you do not want to see it. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Gloria. I'm gonna help him out. I don't want to be sat at the table with this. You deliberate for a moment, then take the napkin off your lap and rise to join Gloria. A moment later, you hear the sound of another chair moving. Your mother joins you. Oh, unity, unity, we're all in this together. The three of you now refill glasses, serve food, and clear away dirty dishes. Sir Elborn tries to make small talk with father, but in vain. So he focuses his attention on grandfather and Stefan. Grandfather is pleased to inform him of Stefan's achievements at the boarding school, especially his exemplary sword fighting skills. He constantly stresses the importance of your elder brother for the future of the family. You listen to him dispassionately as you continue serving new dishes to the table. As you wait at the nobleman's table, you, your sister, and mother never bump into each other. Your labour is impeccable. Grandfather couldn't have found fault with it, even if he tried. Your shoulders and back are aching, but being a manservant inside your own house hurts even more. When the guests finally leave, Mother and Gloria embrace you with relief. You did not neglect your relatives and share their humiliation. And the composure that you have shown gave you new strength. I stand by that. That was the right decision to make. Ooh, nice. Got some willpower out of that. Much needed. A dropped handkerchief. Hot, dry winds swept through the city from the barren lands around it. The noble residents of Anazot prefer to remain in their chambers, while the commoners huddled in tents or in the shade of the silver tree. You're on an errand right now. Your father wrote a letter to a noble acquaintance, and you are to deliver it. Thomas, the boy down the street, is tagging along. The two of you are inseparable now. The errand is an easy one, so you decide to take this opportunity to loiter around the parts of Anazot where the nobles live. So here you are, in the middle of the city square, resting on the ancient brickwork by the old fountain in the merciful shade of the gargantuan silver tree. Thomas is by your side, lazily slouching on the edge of the fountain's basin. Oh, it's a hard life for commoners like you and me. Either you break your back in a workshop day and night hoping someone will buy you good someday, or you become a manservant to some noble. You never get a chance to enjoy life. This is our lot, you remind him. We work, we endure the suffering. But Thomas waves your words away. Yeah, yeah, I know that already. Mother keeps drilling that stuff into me. We must be humble. Our strength is patience and persistence, so yeah. So yeah, I say, but I want to make my fortune no matter what, so how are we now living by my lot, I ask you. But the lots, they, they ain't easy. Let's take you, for example, Bronte. Your father's a nobleman, but even if that didn't make you one, just look at your hands. You've never had to work as hard as me, but we have the same lot, so we're supposed to suffer the same. Or look at your father. He's a judge. He toils at the prefecture day and night doing his judging, and he's a noble. I've never seen an Arcanian work as hard as he does. 
he shrug. The Arcanians are a different race. The books say they were born to rule over humans. They are never commoners, always nobles of the sword by birth. They founded the Empire after subduing all the human kingdoms on the continent. Humans will never be their equals. Arcanians are always better, smarter, stronger, and their skin is a noble shade of blue. If the books are to believe, of course, you've never actually seen one yourself. Your idle chatter is suddenly interrupted by a rugged looking guardsman dressed in black and green. He chases you away from the fountain. Common rabble like you have no place here. You hear the clattering of hooves and wheels against the cobblestones, and see flags bearing a coat of arms. A sable serpent on a field of vert. It makes you squirm. It's the Archduke's coat of arms. The Malanabas dynasty. The carriage doors open, revealing a young lady in a luxurious dress. You cannot look away from her. Those dainty shoulders, suggested but not revealed by the cut of her dress, her black hair cascading over them. Her stately, slim silhouette, her pouty lips and prim nose, and those eyes, dark like the night sky, the way she moves, fluidly, gracefully, and most incredible of all, her skin glows an azure blue. She is a masterpiece given life. She is an Arcanian. Clear the way for me. The Melanidas guardsmen work quickly to clear the way to the fountain for the Arcanian lady. The searing sun dances on her skin in bizarre patterns. With one elegant motion, she reveals a handkerchief, then leans over the basin and wipes her head and neck with its cool water. Well, I'll be. That's Octavia Melanidas, her Archduke's own daughter. The Arcanian turns away and proceeds gracefully back to her carriage. You see something slip out of her hand and fall onto the cobblestones right next to you. A handkerchief. It's right there by your feet. Intricate craftsmanship, expensive woven fabric, delicately decorated with emerald filigree. Your heart skips a beat. Would you dare draw the beautiful Arkin's attention in order to return her lost possession? Or would you rather not attempt to cross the chasm between you and her? Hmm. Hmm. Do I want to use my willpower straight away though? Because <laughs> I keep doing this, I keep getting it and then using it. Give the handkerchief back to Octavia, stash the trophy. You watch the Arcanian lady just depart, trying to burn her every movement into your Ah, sorry, have it back. Milady. It takes a moment to overcome your fear. You follow the young lady Melanidas and call out to her in a nervous voice. She turns around, her beautiful face marred by a puzzled expression. You extend the dropped handkerchief towards her. Lady Octavia's face contorts into a sneer. She signs to the guardsman indifferently. Well, this was clearly a mistake. <laughs> a guardman's gauntlet-clad hand slaps you in the face. It rings your head like a heavy bell. Your nose cracks obediently under this staggering force. The rest of you follow suit, and you fall prone. You can discern the guardman's voice through a painful din in your ears. Should I take the handkerchief back, milady? After a commoner's hands have befouled it, oh, let him wipe himself with it for all I care. The carriage drives away. Thomas runs up to you and drags you back to the fountain. Your head is still ringing from the blow. The faithful handkerchief is still crumpled in your hand. Well, she was a bitch. I thought she was going to be friendly. Turns out I was wrong, and there goes my willpower. Bonk all the way up the wall again. Well done, Nikolaus. But at least I'm still ready for action. Uh huh. But I did get my first romantic feelings, even though she did swiftly have my nose broken, so. Love's complicated like that, I guess. I'm 12! Spring, the quorum decree. Twelve years old now, you overhear an important conversation. It's a spring night, and mother has just sent everyone to bed. You walk past father's study and hear voices coming from beyond the door. Grandfather is yelling, and father is replying quickly. The elder Bronte men are fighting, arguing about the place of the commoners in the city. You sneak outside to avoid mother's attention and hide next to the open window of the study. 
perhaps they'll mention you too. That lowlife idiot had the gall to pay me a visit and beg me for some service. He had the insolence to ask me outright. Thought I was going to support his claim for the chairman's seat in the lesser quorum? How dare he? Father, please listen. Mayor Egmont may be lowborn, but he carries a lot of clout in Margaret. He owns five iron mines. A friend like him could be quite useful. Should he become the chairman of the lesser quorum? I don't give a damn who this Egmont is, Robert. What he is, however, is lowborn. His lot is humility and obedience. The likes of him can never rule anything. They're nothing but a flock of sheep that need a firm, noble hand to guide them. I love, let's not forget, by the way, that Gregor was born lowborn. So to talk about forgetting where you come from, and also being a huge hound of shit. I wasted so many years trying to quash that quorum decree. But that accursed Cornelius Tempest did everything in his power to make the Emperor sign that pathetic screed. And now even lowlifes can wield power. True power, Robert! Just the right to discuss the size of the Archduke's tax, nothing more. Oh, that's only the beginning. What's next? Are they going to arm the lowlifes now? Make them into judges? If the Empire rejects the foundations and the lots, the entire edifice will crumble. Blah! Who am I telling this to? It's already crumbling, and you, my son and heir, are the harbinger of its destruction. Father, I'm begging you, I do not wish to marry a third time. Lydia is a good wife and a dutiful mother to my children. If you would only allow her to... I will allow them nothing. Neither Egmont, nor the freeloading wench of yours. What will you want me to do next? Live by the laws of the lowborn? I can already see where this is going, and I'd rather run my own sword through my gut than live in a country where nobles and lowlife share the same rights. My only dream is to see the name of Bronte in the Blue Book, but that dream will never come true. They will never call me Venerable El Bronte, and it's all because of this marriage of yours. My only hope now is to hear Stefan addressed in such a manner one day. Thank the twins I didn't let you ruin the boy. He is about to grow up a true nobleman. His children will bear the name of El Bronte. You have two more grandsons. Those spineless milksops from the common lot. They are incapable of anything. The best your middle son could do is sneak into the Imperial College and get a noble by the mandrel. Although I have grave doubts about even that. As for that downtrodden Nathan, I hold out no hope for him whatsoever. You hear Grandfather's heavy footsteps and thudding of his cane and the slamming of the door. It's time to sneak back home before you're discovered. Oh, he just finds new and impressive ways to be just even worse. Good God. School beginning. You started studying at the school of Sir Tibor and began to master the sciences. storm of expectations. Finally, the day comes when the teachers stop coming to the house, but before you can breathe a sigh of relief and put away the books, father asks you to come to his study. You've grown up, my son. It's time for you to continue your education away from home. I've chosen a deserving school for you, Sir Tivor's school for the children of noblemen and well-off commoners. Naturally, it's not a boarding school for nobles, so you will study there during the day and come home in the evening. You share the news with your best friend, Thomas. Sir Tibor's school, eh? Yeah, I've got to ask my parents to send me there too as soon as they get the coin together. Father says his workshop has toiled day and night for years to save up for my education. The school is based in an ancient estate of art and design. The classrooms are tall and spacious with massive benches. The sounds of scraping quills and lectures on history and imperial law and theology echo under the vaulted ceilings. The rules are strict, the lessons tiring. Restless Thomas keeps getting distracted, and several times he gets his hand slapped with a stick for it. Every teacher demands flawless mastery of their subject. Every day, Father asks you about your studies. You've already told him twice how Magra joined the Empire and how the Nobles' Court of Honour is different from the Commoners' Civil Court in the City Prefecture. But Father keeps pressuring you to work even harder. When it's time to go to bed, Mother will not let you go to sleep until you recite a newly learned prayer for her. And when it's time to go to school, 
You promise her every day that you will behave with great humility and steer clear of insolent behaviour of any kind, but you still live by the commoner's lot, and that lot is hard work and suffering. Your first month in school draws to a close, and the teachers announce that there will be exams at the end of the month that determine the best and worst students in each subject. Your father insists that you devote all your spare time to studying law and history if you wish to follow in his footsteps. When you speak to mother every day, you start considering theology. You still remember the revelation and divine visions that came to you in your earliest years. You have only one more day until the exam. You've locked yourself away in your room. It's already getting late. Your desk is covered in handwritten notes surrounded by leather-bound books. Just looking at them makes you queasy, but you have to read through all of them again, at least for one of your subjects. There's a nagging thought on your mind. Thomas ended up in big trouble the other day. He got in a fight with several boys who lived down the street. They heard about your wooden fortress and got in an outrage by the fortification built by commoners. They swore to dismantle it tonight. Thomas swore he would defend the fortress until the end. Perhaps you should abandon the books to rescue your friend in need. But then you hear your little brother Nathan knocking at the door. He stands there shyly, not saying a word. He often does that. Standing still and staying speechless until either you speak first, or he runs away. But this time, he actually says something. The, the, the door is locked. Are you okay, Nikos? Is there anything I can do to help? Your head is spinning. This is the last evening before the school exam. If you fail, your family will be very disappointed. You have to refresh your memory on law or theology. Either one or the other. Thomas and your fort are about to be stormed. Why today, of all days? You grind your teeth in rage at the thought. Nathan is by the door, trying not to bother you. He wants to help you the only way he can, for reasons known only to him. Will you accept his help? Oh man. This feels like a crossroads moment. I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a moment with Nathan, because Nathan is not doing well. He has the the, the sacrament broke him, I think. So I'm going to spend a bit of time with Nate. Sorry, Thomas. You're a big lad. You'll be alright. You cannot help but pay attention to your brother's quiet, weak voice. You push the books away. Nathan runs to you and wraps his arms around your legs. They should just leave you alone. I don't want you to get sick. Warmth emanates from his hands. You feel the burden of the responsibilities thrust upon you fall from your shoulders. At last, you realise something. You can make your own decisions rather than submitting to the will of others. You laugh at this realisation and feel a new spring in your step. Nathan laughs with joy when he feels this. He takes your hand and pulls you outside. You've studied enough. You spend the rest of the evening playing with your little brother, teaching him how to build a watchtower out of wooden planks, sticks and old rags behind the house. Nathan's success in construction leaves much to be desired. Unlike his skill in covering himself with mud, still, he is absolutely overjoyed. I stand by that decision. The morning comes. You barely have time to wake up before walking to the menacing edifice of the school. The entire day is a constant flow of questions demanding answers. You give satisfactory responses on law and history, although you're somewhat confused by the many technicalities and chronological orders. Your knowledge of the interpretations of the lots leaves much to be desired. Your parents are dissatisfied with your performance. You know that you could have worked harder. I mean, yeah, obviously. Still, you believed yesterday was not a waste. No, I, yeah, I fully agree with that. Fully agree with that. Ah, oh, full of power. Unlimited power. Noble titles. Your education continues. As you study imperial law, you come to realise that there's a certain hierarchy, even within the noble estate. It seems your father's status is not quite equal to that of the more eminent human and Archean gentry. You return home with this new information at your disposal. Father asks you about school after dinner, as he always does. And what is the difference between nobles of the mantle and those of the sword, Niklaus? You already have an answer ready. The latter status is hereditary meaning that it's passed down from father to son. After the Archneans, nobles of the sword are the most eminent humans of the Empire. 
They own lands and estates, they fill offices of the highest ranks, and the names of their bloodlines are preserved within the Great Blue Book. Nobility of the sword can only be granted by the overseer of the province or the emperor himself. And how are such eminent people addressed? With the honorific L before their last name you respond. Sir Augustine L. Bourne, for example. Father pats you on the shoulder, clearly pleased. And what about the Arcnians and their status? What have you learned about them? The Arcnians stand above all human gentry. They're born to rule over humans regardless of their title. No L is required when addressing them. They need no honorifics, for the names of their ancient dynasties are known to all. Father nods somberly. Yes, we can never be their equals. Do whatever an Arcnian tells you, and never defy them. Ever. And what about Grandfather and me? Where do we stand as nobles? Oh, that's easy. Father and Grandfather are nobles of the mantle. This title cannot be inherited, but it can be earned by any commoner as a reward for great service to the Empire, in the Legion, or as a civil servant. Father suddenly grows quiet and looks you in the eye intently. Yes, and someday you will earn a noble title too, son. All in due time. And then I'm going to burn this system to the ground, father. Sons of the nobility. Sir Tibor's school teaches children all stripes. Nobles of the mantle and lowborn parents can send their sons there. And every passing day, the children of noblemen invent new ways to snub and bully the commons. Most of the time, the bully leading them is Deidre, the son of the secretary for the imperial chancellery and a self-important snob. The sons of noblemen never pick on you, however. They know your father has been a noble by the mantle. However, Diedrich and his retinue soon choose Thomas as their favourite victim. Time and time again, you ask your friends not to pay them any mind, but again and again, Thomas grows angry and snaps at their self-satisfied mockery. It's early morning. The students are busy flocking to the classroom for the next lesson. You wave Thomas over when you see him. He waves back at you, and then a bucket full of slop splashes on him. Needless to say, it's the work of Diedrich and his entourage. You hear his familiar creaky laughter. The tailor's son stinks. How dare he sit next to decent folk? Thomas clenches his fists. You're dead, Diedrich. He throws himself at Diedrich's haughty entourage like a soldier ready to wage war. He attacks them first. This is just what they expect is, and now they're free to retaliate. He barely makes one movement before four pairs of hands grab him at once. Diedrich sneers and kicks your friend in the belly. Thomas gasps for air and starts coughing. You stand between them as Diedrich readies another kick. The nobleman's son cocks an eyebrow. Why do you mingle with commoners? He asks. Your father is a noble of the mantle. You ought to be friends with your own kind, your equals, not the dirt beneath your feet. Behind him, four boys hold Thomas down as he struggles furiously. The other students are watching him, frozen in fear. Diedrich haughtily extends a hand to you. He clearly expects you to shake it. What will you do? I mean, no, obviously. Challenge Diedrich to a fight, turn him over to the teachers, admonish the noble son. Shake it. I'm going to admonish because it doesn't matter. We're all, we're all under the commoners a lot of the way. We're all in the same book. It doesn't matter who your parents are. You snobby little shit. You make a speech, not to the lead bully himself, but rather to his retinue. How come Diedrich seems himself fit to instigate fights? His family may be higher in rank, but like everyone else here, he has yet to take the nobleman's sacrament himself. The nobleman's lot is not his yet, so he is not yet fit to fight or rule. Neither are any of you. The twin gods are ever watching over us, you add, and they are ever vigilant. Do you dare to defy their will? Diedrich tries to retort. They've broken no laws, he says. All they've done is teach commoners the meaning of suffering. Call upon the knowledge gained from your theology lessons and easily pick his arguments apart. Every man's first duty is to follow his lots, and Diedrich and his friends lack the humility to accept that they are not yet true nobles. The hands holding Thomas down grow weak. There's a whisper among the students around you. You're right. The twins are always watching how we follow the lots. 
Diedrich's retinue quickly dissolves in embarrassment. He furiously orders them to come back and join his cause, but his exhortations are all in vain. The other boys are clearly impressed by your words. The noble children will think twice before acting out again. That, that was a good choice. Cool. I'll take it. Um, 13. Time to start acting out like a teenager. Silver Tree. Your theology teachers tell you more about Anazot. It is more than just the provincial capital. It's also a sacred place blessed by the gods. It's where the swing gods' first disciples spilled their blood, and from that blood grew the sacred silver tree. Its enormous foliage hangs over the city. You see its branches in the sky every day, but you've never approached the trunk of the tree yourself. Today, you'll be taking your first trip to the silver tree. Your class is visiting a service in the great temple by the tree's very roots. Thanks to your theology teacher, you and the other students will witness this landmark of the twins' advent up close. Everybody is excited. Soon, you and the other boys enter the slums, surrounding the church district of Anazot. The roots are pulsating under your feet. They spread underground all through the area. Pathetic, cramped hovels and filthy streets surrounded the tree of the trunk. Their home to the paupers, day labourers and preachers. The people of the district bow humbly to you and point towards the temple. They seem at peace despite the abject poverty in which they live. All who live directly beneath the tree are filled with its divine grace, your teacher says. People come here to make peace with the world and their faith in it. Your class is unusually quiet. Everyone is listening to the rustling of the leaves and the underground beating of the roots. The sky above you is obscured by the tree's canopy. You find the temple of the twin gods right next to the tremendous trunk of the tree. It almost seems to be part of it. There's a crowd there. Pilgrims dressed in travelling clothes, paupers and beggars, common people of the city, and the occasional well-dressed noble. There are arguments among some people who are gathered in separate small groups. Many people are wandering around, staring upwards at the tree's branches. The tree impresses you with its might and the calm emanating from it. You're filled with the desire to sit down and think of the world, to learn something about yourself, to touch the silver white bark, and hearken to the whispering leaves. You're distracted enough to fall back from the rest of your classmates. You notice a small path. It should take you right to the trunk. A tall, red-haired woman walks out of the crowd of pilgrims. She's wearing a warm white robe. She is no longer young, but her face is youthful and covered in freckles. Her hands clutch a book. You've never seen this lady pilgrim before. Yet she looks at you almost as if she's recognised a lifelong friend. She beckons to you and says her name, Mathil, a preacher from Astinia. What she says next shakes you to your very core. It is commendable to see a young man so keen to learn the teachings of the twins, she says. Yet you will never follow the light of truth within the walls of the temple. Inside you will find only the lies about the lots. The erring words of Prophet Isatius, sanctified by the passage of centuries. Yet anyone who sets out to read the accounts of the twins' own lives know that they never so much as mention the lots. I knew it! I knew this was a man-made dickery. The red-haired preacher's words frighten you. They clash with everything you've heard from mother, everything you've been taught at school. The lots are a lie? You freeze in fear. Should you argue with Matilda or ask her for more information? Should you treat her as a madwoman and catch up with your classmates? No. Tell me more. Tell me more. You f suddenly feel a small, warm hand grasp your own. You see a girl right next to you. She is just a little older than you, wearing a black dress. Threadbare, yet almost spotless. Her hair is covered by a handkerchief, with only a single golden lock showing. Her brown eyes are burning with rage, her hand pulling you away from the red-haired preacher. You stare in confusion at the strange young girl, your cheeks flushed by the sudden touch. There's just a bit of colour on her cheeks too, but then she starts speaking to you quickly. Don't listen to her, she's dangerous. Come to the temple with me. Only there will you see the truth. You stand there, surrounded by the crowd of praying pilgrims and the sound of shuffling feet, torn between two people you've never seen before. 
and each of them expects you to follow. But all the while, you hear the whispering of the wind in the tree's branches. The branches reach out to you, almost as if the tree wishes to speak to you itself. Can you hear its voice? Follow the girl into the temple, stay with the red-haired pilgrim, leave them and approach the tree. No, I want to I hear what the red-haired woman says. I want. It might be that she's playing into my ideals and she's just talking shit, but... You shrug, smile sheepishly at the girl and walk towards the red-haired creature. It's Matilde from Astinia. She speaks too strangely to be ignored. You feel, you feel that she'll be leaving soon anyway. And the temple? Surely the temple's not going anywhere. The lady preacher hands her book to you. There are words on the cover. The Lives of the Twins. The book is so heavy, you almost drop it. The crowd around you barely allows for a proper reading. The best you can do is flip through the pages and hope to get a glimpse of a message or two from it. Matilde's hushed voice comments on each new page. This book was written by the disciples of the twins. When the twin gods descended and brought faith into the world, they walked the lands with them. It is filled with many stories of wonders and battles, as well as records of the twins' own sermons and dialogues. They discuss many things that now guide the living. The fate that awaits us at the Shining Pillar, the eternal life after true death, the profane evil of magic. Yet, Matilde points out something that you cannot help but notice yourself. There is not one mention of the lot in this book. How can this be? you ask her. It is what it is, she responds. The twins never spoke of them. They never left any teaching behind. Nothing but their deeds and their own lives in this world. You frown. Then, then how can we come to know about the lots now? They exist thanks to Isatius, she says. Isatius, favoured by the gods, the elder's favourite disciple, walked the lands by his side, and through all his hardships until his fatal end in Eterna. They came to be, she explains. When people came to Isatius and asked him how they should live. Yet, Isatius was a man, and his teachings of the Lots were not a divine revelation, but a speculation of his own devising. This feels much tougher than learning prayers. So if the teachings of the Lots came not from the gods, but rather from their student, what does that mean for you? What does it mean for people? A new faith, the red-haired preacher says with a smile. You think about her words for a long time, as the silver tree whispers above your head, the very tree grown from the blood of the people who walked the land with the younger and the elder. You keep on thinking about it even as you make your way home and into bed. Your conclusions bring you no comfort. If the strange lady preacher was right, then you're supposed to be free to interpret the twins' words yourself, which means that you, and only you, should be responsible for your life and fate in the hereafter. But who can tell for sure? You can't fall asleep that night, so they were lying to you all this time. In the morning, you still mutter off a prayer and the words of your lots, to work, endure, and suffer. But is it all worth it if the lots don't really exist? Or, or is this the will of the twins after all? Did they actually speak their will through Isatius? And those who defy that will are defying the true order of the world. These questions will remain in your mind for a long time. This has given me much to think about because I I wanted this to be a man-made construct. And if it turns out that it's just this Isatius was a shady little bitch and decided to use his power to construct this this system to benefit him. If it's man-made, I can dismantle it. Because I want to burn it down. I don't know if I've mentioned that yet. I don't know if you picked up on those subtle vibes, but I want to burn this shit down. Ooh, spirituality's going up. Nice. The Shadow of the Past. Another school day has ended. You're making your way home, still mulling over the things you learned from your teachers. The founding of the Empire. The eternal and unshakable rules of a single dynasty. The three estates, each with its own rights. What an odd sort of order the world has, and yet so mysterious. At least, it sounds that way when the teachers talk about it. Mother's waiting for you on the porch. She smiles gently when she sees you, and yet her expression still shows great concern. 
father left on a trip to several distant Magran towns a few days ago. Since then, mother has been trying to tell you something, but she seems uncertain. Son, could you put your things away and come pray with me? You join mother in, in a prayer to the twins. She prays with fervent sincerity, her head bowed low, reciting the words of obedience to them and their greater design in a barely audible whisper. You repeat after her, just as she's taught you ever since you were a little boy. When the prayer ends, mother sighs and turns to you. Niklaus, my son, you are 13 now. You'll be grown soon. It's time you learned about certain things that are important to our family. Difficult things. It's about your father and me. About our marriage. Ooh. Okay, yeah, because this is... Seems like a bit of a, like, tangled web. You gaze curiously into Mother's eyes. I'm sure you've wondered about this before. Your father is a nobleman of the man. So how could he marry a commoner with another man's child? But you see, Nicholas, your father... When his first wife Amalia Elborn died, it was a painful blow to him. He lost the will to live, lost all purpose. He felt like his own destiny was cut short that day as well. After then, he met me. You know the troubles I had in the past. I went to the prefecture as a petitioner to ask them for help, protection, justice. When I was a young girl, I worked at a small shop that sold crockery and dishes. A nobleman took a liking to me. May his name be forever forgotten. The twins know I was humble and honoured his lot to rule. But he took me by force. Mother falls silent, summoning the courage to continue. Oh. Gloria is that nobleman's daughter, but he was outraged. How could I have the gall to burden him with a low-born progeny? He turned me out to the street with the little baby girl in my arms. Oh, shit. Mother's voice is shaking now. You take her hand tenderly. I had no home, no honour, nowhere to go, no one to help me. When I went to the prefecture, I didn't really think the judges would help me find justice against my former master. But when Sir Robert heard my plea, his eyes met mine, and I believe that, at that very moment, the twins themselves granted him the gift of their love. Your father told me that there was nothing he could do to make that detestable nobleman marry me, but he would never abandon me and baby Gloria, and if I agreed, he would take me into his own home. Tears are running down mother's cheeks, and I knew it, my son. I knew how much his honour and reputation would suffer, but caring for me brought him back to life. It's like he experienced another sacrament, he rediscovered his noble purpose, his lot to rule and protect and care for others, but his decision to marry me, he is still paying for it today. Your father had the courage to defy your grandfather, the founder of his bloodline. If only you knew how much he had to endure, my son. If only you knew about the despicable rumours we heard about the Brontes all over Anazot. It was only thanks to the efforts of Sir Gregor that the Bronte bloodline managed to hang on to what little remained of its reputation. And now, the noble families have all but forgotten about that scandal. Thank the twins. Mother falls silent. She looks at you intently. Do you understand what she's telling you? My son, I am not telling you this just to share the pain of my past. I have no reason to complain. Even Sir Gregor has accepted me through gritted teeth. But you need to understand the heavy burden our family must bear, including our scandalous marriage and Gloria's foul origin. And Gloria, she can never be a Bronte. Even if the elder Brontes agree, the news would stir up the old scandal in the minds of high society. And if that were to happen, Niklaus, they would see even your birth as illegitimate. Mother sighs heavily. What I told you just now is something you have to know, son. You are about to enter adult life. By my lot, I must be humble. I cannot tell you how to treat your family. But may I ask you a question? Now that you know all of this, do you still see Gloria as your sister? Yes, obviously. That never even a question. It, awful. Awful that you can even do that. What is good for the family is good for you. Fuck that. 
No, obviously I'm going to accept Moria. That's not not even a hesitation on that. Filled with determination, you assure Mother that Gloria is and will always be your sister. You want Gloria to be a Bronte too. You want her to be part of the family. Who cares what the nobles of Anazot say? Mother beams with quiet joy when she hears this. Oh, Niklaus, if only you knew how happy that would make me to have our family united at last. However, the joy on her face quickly gives way to concern. But I already owe good Sir Robin a death I can never repay. He's given my daughter so much, a home, an education, his care and advice. The Bronte bloodline could suffer so much from Gloria's existence. We should all just learn to accept her status as it is. Just then, you hear Gloria carefully knock at the door of Mother's chambers. Mother, N Nicholas, I couldn't find you. You happily greet your sister. Yes, she is your sister. No old secrets can ever change that. Mother gives you and Gloria a kiss on the forehead and returns to her prayers. You and your sister walk downstairs together. Mother is alone by her bedside now, thanking the twins with a quiet prayer for the Bronte family they have given her. You hope they can hear her. Ah, oh, God, me and Gloria are like besties. And Mother loves me. Mother loves me. Full the flash and the flame. You are 13 now. Another theology lesson. Today's sermon is about the priests and why the clergy is the only one of the three estates with the right to interpret the lights and guide the two estates accordingly. Thomas sits next to you, puffing and puffing as he fervently writes down the teacher's every word. But you've heard all this from Mother many times before, so you take this moment to daydream a little. Father promised to take you to the capital once your studies are complete. But the teacher quickly casts a stern look around the lecture hall and raises his voice at one of your classmates. A boy named Brian jumps out of his seat. The teacher asks him to repeat what he just said. Brian freezes and seems to shrink. He tries to muster a reply, but nothing comes out. The class becomes agitated. Someone's about to get punished. The teacher now looms over Brian. The boy's cheeks are flushed and his eyes are covered in tears. You all watch the teacher's iron-bound book as he raises it sharply, about to strike. Brian shrieks and raises a hand in front of him. A sudden flash. The teacher screams and buries his face in his arms. His hair is ablaze and his skin is covered in horrible burns. It's magic. Real magic. Just like the books about the Marvel Rebellion. Class freezes in shock. There's a dull thud as the iron-bound book falls to the floor. Brian's hysterical laughter rends the silence. He stands up from his bench, fire in his eyes and sparks on his fingertips. There are screams now. Students run for the door. The teacher tries to extinguish his burning hair. Brian snaps his fingers and the books of Isaetius on the desks turn into pillars of flame. He laughs and raises his arms and the curtains catch fire. The screams grow louder as the fire howls. Brian's face is tense and violent. His mouth is spewing flames and his whole body is shaking with laughter. He steps towards the door. You and Tomas glance at each other. He's going to burn the whole school down. Your friend's determination makes you brave. You run behind Brian and knock him off his feet. You both tumble to the floor. Even through his clothes, his body sears your flesh. Brian screams, convulses, and grabs Thomas by the shoulders with his burning hands. Thomas howls, but he stays put. Then knocks Brian senseless with several fierce blows to the head. There are servants fussing around the room now. They put out the fire and take away the teacher, his body covered in horrible burns. You and Thomas remain next to Brian, who's lying on the floor, silent. Soon, three men in black cloaks enter the doors of the school, each bearing an edict sealed with silver. The Inquisition. You and Thomas are told to step away from the witch. They lock Brian's neck in a silver collar and take him away. One of the Inquisitors remained behind to tell the students what happened. That was magic, he explained. The ungodly power that twists the mind of men into savage instruments of murder. Only the sacred shackles of silver can hold it at bay. Only the power of the twins can save us all from its evil grasp. The next day, you are forbidden from ever mentioning Brian's name again. He is no more. Oh god damn! That's a good turn! 
Nice. Me and Thomas are continuing to be besties. What I like? The nobleman's lot. A great day looms ahead. One hundred years ago, Uther Tempest was anointed to rule over the Empire. Blessed by the kings themselves, the Emperor's reign continues into its second sanctuary. Celebrations in honour of the Tempest dynasty are held throughout the city, and the school is closed for two weeks because of it. On one of these evenings, Father tells everyone that Grandfather is going to bring Stefan back for the holiday. Yay. They say family should celebrate the Day of Anointment together. You could benefit from your elder brother's company. With his noble education, Stefan might be able to teach you how noblemen are supposed to act. Soon, Stefan arrives. He now handles himself differently. When it comes to ordering servants around and ignoring Gloria, he is still grandfather's double. But he's more grown up and far less haughty to you. It's a dark winter evening. A damp, cold wind sweeps through the city from the barren lands of Marbre. You and Stefan are sitting in the library. He's telling you all about Eterna, the capital of the Empire. It is full of so many wonders. The Imperial Palace, the enormous Temple of the Twins, the Military Academy, the Imperial College. You've read so much about these places, yet he has seen them all firsthand. Nathan enters the library. He looks concerned. I, I can't find Gloria. I've, I've looked everywhere. She's not in the attic. She's not in the sitting room. She's not in the kitchen. I heard she wanted to sneak off to the ruins of Shah Milad Melanadas's palace. She could be lost in there. You and Stefan exchange looks. Shah Melanadas, the rebellious duke. The ruins of his palace are a dangerous place. Some children claim his tainted magic still lingers there which means you absolutely have to make your way there and back again to prove you're not afraid of the long dead witch. Your brother tells you to wait. He leaves and soon returns with his sword in its sheath. Get ready, Nicholas. We're going to rescue Gloria. She must have gone to the ruins in search of inspiration for another one of her little rhymes. The two of you entrust Nathan to tell your parents you've gone for a walk in the square. You and your elder brother head outside. You're confused by Stefan's actions. He refuses to treat Gloria like a human being, so why is he so determined to rescue her? Stefan notices your expression. You wondering why I care about Gloria all of a sudden? I can't act in any other way, can I? The law of honour compels me to protect my family. Gloria will never be a Bronte, but Father still took her into our house. I must respect his seniority and defend Gloria like she's our own. You're a Bronte too, noble or not, which means it's your duty to aid me. The ruins of Shah Melanodas' palace span an entire district. The palace was abandoned centuries ago, and its remnants are overgrown with thick underbrush. The ruined palace is empty, nothing but cold wind blowing over crumbling brickwork. Even the worst scum of the land steer clear of this place. You make your way through the ruins until you spot scattered sheets of paper covered in writing. Your sister's writing. You hear loud laughter coming from behind a dilapidated stone wall nearby. You pull yourself up to peer over it. Gloria is lying on the ground, face down, twitching and sobbing. A gaggle of young thugs surround her, cackling and swinging their arms about. Oh, I don't like this. You hear their shouts. Ah, oh, look at the lass sitting here rhyming words together. She thinks she's all noble, but don't you worry, you low-born tart. We're going to teach you your place. One of the louts spits on Gloria as she lies there. Get away from her this instant, you bastards, or I'll spill your guts. They respond with mocking laughter. Stefan draws his sword. The street thugs recoil in fear, but they soon notice that he is only one armed man against many. They start reaching out for sticks and stumps. Stay by my side. Don't let them flank me. Stefan's hand shakes, but he looks ready for battle. He is outnumbered. For a moment, you hesitate. Perhaps it might be better to run for the nearby district and call the guards. The young thugs are already armed with makeshift weapons. They start approaching you and Stefan cautiously. Okay, I am gonna follow I'm gonna follow Stefan's orders because he's been he's had trait. He knows what he's doing. I'm a shooter. Stefan's firm voice fills you with confidence. You follow your noble brother's orders. It takes a moment to grab a stick, and then you are at Stefan's back angrily swinging at the louts as they try to bring him down. One of the louts lunges at your brother with a stone, 
but you hit him with a stick, and he falls down right at Stefan's feet. His sword flashes. The blade sinks deep into the young man's stomach. He wheezes. Blood starts pouring onto the ground. The thugs freeze. Stefan pulls the sword out, his face an inscrutable mask, and returns to his fighting stance. You're stunned to see Stefan take another man's life so easily and effortlessly. Like picking his own teeth, the thugs look like they're about to flee. There's a rage and confusion on their faces. They never expected the young nobleman to use that sword. Stefan just scoff scoffs at them. Lowborn scum, that's all you are. This is the only language you understand. Good job, brother. Gloria, get up. We're going home. He turns to glance at your sister giving the enraged thugs just enough time to rush you. You get separated from Stefan. Your back is against the wall now. They hit you hard in the stomach, then the face, then the side of your head, and your mind slips away. When the darkness disperses, you find yourself lying in bed. Stefan is in the armchair next to you, reading a book. He's alive. With the left arm in a sling and a black eye, but still alive. Your head is spinning, and you feel nauseous. You try your best to sit up. Stefan looks up from the book. Don't try to get up. You lost a lot of blood. I suppose that was a few thugs too many for a single warrior. Even with good backup. I'm impressed. We fought like an army. The noble orders. The commoner obeys. All according to our lots. We defended the family honour tonight. You know, brother. The nobleman's lot is also a great burden that few are able to bear. It takes courage. Not to fight everything you see, but to do your duty. Each and every decision a nobleman makes becomes a part of his family's legacy, flowing in the blood tide forever. I think about it often. A noble mustn't act weak. A noble mustn't suffer like people born of the lowborn lot. A noble must rule over them wisely. A noble must ensure that they have work to do. It's not merely your own lot you have to look after. You have to ensure that a thousand others can live by their lot as well. And there are so many more matters to take care of. Honour, dignity, tradition. It's tough, but it's what it takes to be a nobleman. Do you understand what I'm talking about? There is approval in your brother's eyes, for the first time in a long while. It was a pleasure to fight by your side, brother. Yeah, okay. I wasn't expecting us to be friends. Ever. But I lost some willpower, but I'm still ready for action. This is fine. I'm good with that. Trial of the Assailants. Before long, the entire city hears how a gang of low-born thugs assaulted Stefan Bronte. Grandfather ensures that the brash young men are found. Some of them are taken into custody as soon as Lesser Death releases them. Grandfather seeks vengeance on those who hurt his favourite grandson. Prefect Elborn, a friend of the family, promises to personally oversee the trial and ensure that justice is served. Stefan and Grandfather decide to stay in Anazots until the trial ends. Grandfather demands true death for every single assailant. You ask Father to explain something. How can a legal court sentence criminals to true death? How can worldly judgement overrule the Quinn's law? Your words are true, my son. Their law is second to none. Yet the Twin Gods also made the Empire and all its ways. The Court of Law exists to execute the laws of heaven here in the world. Should the Court of Law sentence a person to death, the law high above will always enforce it, and so every execution brings true death. The commoners who assaulted Stefan, a born nobleman, have committed a grave offence. There is no doubt about that. And yet, according to the Emperor's decree, even commoners have the right to defend themselves when they're about to face a true death. This means that all of us have to appear at the trial and testify before the court. Evening comes. Gloria visits your room. She looks crestfallen, and her fingers keep reaching for her long hair. You put away your school books and ask what's bothering her. The, the, the trial is tomorrow. I thought I was going to appear there too as an eyewitness after all this whole mess started because of me, but so Robert isn't even going to mention that I was there. Can you imagine? He says it would ruin the case. Why am I always in the way? Nobody ever mentions me. Nobody has to listen to me. It's like I don't even exist. 
Ah, oh, well, Stefan standing up for me actually meant something. Maybe I, maybe I was going to become part of the family. But no, everything is back to usual now. Gloria tries her best to hold back the tears. You do your best to comfort her. Father just needs to keep the family out of trouble. If Sir Robert believes I will only bring trouble, why did he take me into his house at all? Gloria runs away. You return to your books, but you can't help but get lost in thought. What if they told the court you weren't there either? How would you feel then? There's a knock on the door. It's Father. He closes the door behind him and sits next to you. There's an exhausted look about him. Son, you will be testifying before the court tomorrow. Please remember what I'm about to tell you. Gloria wasn't at the ruins at all. You went there with your brother to inspect this historic site. The lowborn men insulted Stefan first and then attacked him. Stefan had managed to deal with the assailant on his own by the time the guards intervened. Gloria will cast suspicion on the case. If we mention her very existence to the court, the reputation of the family will suffer. Your grandfather will never forgive me if that happens. Do not let me down. We're all counting on you. You recall the night of the fight like it was a moment ago. Gloria sprawled under the feet of those cackling thugs. Her poetry, her greatest treasure, scattered on the ground. She thinks she is all noble. They were the words they spat down at her. But doesn't grandfather mean the same thing when he denies that she's part of the family? But if you do what father tells you, the trial will end quickly. Those commoners will face true death for assaulting a noble. If you mention Gloria, things will get complicated and you can't predict how the trial will end. Which is more important to you? What is right or what is just? Okay, so I can convince Father to change his mind. You're determined to change Father's opinion and make sure Gloria gets the fair treatment she deserves. Yes! Yes! You look Father straight in the eye and tell him what you think. You are not going to bear false witness in court. He is the judge himself. How can he make you lie to Sir L. Gordon? And what of Gloria? Is she not a Bronte too? Does she not deserve justice? Or maybe Grandfather's right, and she is just a freeloader who deserves nothing but shame. If so, then how come Father agreed to take her into his home under his protection? Saying this to Father is tough. Deep inside, you pray he hears no weakness in your voice, and sees no blood rushing to your cheeks. But it seems he is listening to you intently. The wrinkles on his forehead grow deeper as his fingers stammer out a staccato against the armrest. This is going to be tough, son, but you're right. You are right. I took Gloria into my home, and so I must protect her like my own daughter. This was my decision, and I must stand by it. I will speak with Stefan in the morning. Now I pray your grandfather never hears of my change of heart. The day comes. The trial takes place in the lesser hall of the city prefecture. Sir, Sir Elborn himself presides as the judge. You were the first to testify. You tell the court the truth about what happened. How the thugs humiliated Gloria, how Stefan and you came to help her, and how Stefan defended his half-sister. Out of the corner of your eye, you watch Grandfather's face grow red, yet he remains silent. There are confused whispers in the hall. The commoners on trial cry out. It's the truth. Gloria was reciting poetry and they simply told her she was defying her lot. The situation has changed. By this account, Stephen was not acting in defence of himself or another. He merely assaulted them first in order to retaliate against those who insulted his half-sister. You spread your feet to stand firm and inhale before you speak next. You ask the hall, is it not a nobleman's duty to honour his family's name? Gloria does not have the Bronte name but your father took her into his home. Therefore, it was Stefan's duty to protect her, as he would have protected any of us. Contemptuous chuckles rush through the courtroom. You have just reminded the city of father's shameful second marriage. Whoopsie. Stefan is to testify next. He reluctantly confirms your testimony, glancing at father and grandfather all the while. His arm in the sling is his main argument. Stefan wanted the commoners to stop insulting Gloria, yet in the end, the commoners were the first to assault him. After a short recess, Sir Elborn returns and arises to deliver his sentence. The court of Anazot finds you guilty of assaulting Stefan L. Bronte, a nobleman, who stood in defence of the honour of Gloria, a member of his household. 
all four defendants are sentenced to true death by hanging. There is no wind, but you feel a gust sweep through the hall. The defendants turn pale. Their mothers are bawling and crying. Everyone in the court feels the dreadful power of the law, and it is stern and just. That very power has been invoked by this sentence, and by that very sentence the lives of four young men are literally forfeit for all eternity. The gallows await. Stefan stands in the front row, father stands next to him, the wood creaks, the trapdoors open under the young men's feet, they dangle in the air, wheezing and reaching out for support with their feet in their final moments. Grandfather's silence ends at home. He screams at you and father, at Stefan and Gloria. This trial is a disgrace! His screams are punctuated by the thudding of his walking stick against the floor. Father says that he had to defend their family. It would have truly been a disgrace if they had shirked their responsibilities. Stefan excuses himself to bandage his arm in order to stay out of the argument. Gloria is quiet, but glowing. You stay quiet too. It's all over now. It's his all over now. Nobody bullies Gloria on the streets anymore. Those four commoners are dead forever. Their families were taught a cruel lesson. So will it be with anyone who dares to raise his hand against the noble. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> Oh no, Unity's gone up. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. And Tarnished Honor. Yeah, that's inevitable really, wasn't it? Uh, honorable, Soulful, ready for action. Okay. An adult question. This event is a consequence of your previous actions. Okay. Bring it to me. The day is sunny, scorching, and hot. You're sitting in the yard in the shade of a tree, studying books about the twins' great descent. You hear shy, quiet steps. There's no need to look back. You know from the sound that it's Nathan. Your younger brother also sits in the shade of the tree. Yet he is quiet. He's not tugging at your clothes this time. That's unusual. He's just sitting by your side, breathing loudly. You take yourself away from the book and look at your brother. Nathan is deep in thought. He seems uneasy. His is fidgeting with a symbol of the swims. A cross inside a circle, the lash bound around the sword. It's Nathan's pendant. He wears it all the time, but not today. The silence wears on. Nathan takes a deep breath, like he's about to speak. But he doesn't. His face grows even grimmer. He looks unusually hurt and bitter. At last, Nathan gathers his courage. He takes another deep breath, his eyes narrow. His hand clutches the encircled cross. Tell me, Klaus, the twins, they, they hate me, don't they? Nathan's voice is quiet, yet firm. The words fall silent around you, not even a gust of wind can be heard. It's as if everything is waiting for you to answer. You look at your brother again, confused. Nathan, the youngest brother, the most unassuming child, he is quiet, obedient, and thoughtful. He's been your responsibility almost since his birth. Yet, he's never been a burden. Father was always aloof around him, and mother was too tired to even smile. Even grandfather seemed to avoid Nathan with his scorn. He just treated your little brother like a piece of trash. He never called him by name, and always winced at the sight of him. Perhaps because he looked so much like mother. But is it true that the twin gods had no love for your little brother? Surely the twins have enough even for little Nathan, do they not? Nathan was born a commoner, like you. His lot is suffering. Everyone is tested by the twins before their true death. No one can expect mercy along their path. He was born the youngest child in your family. That is his trial. Should Nathan persevere and bear the burden he was dealt, he shall yet reach the peak of the pillar when his time runs out. There is hope in Nathan's eyes as he looks at you. Guiding others in matters of faith is the clergy's lot. You are no priest, yet you can't stay quiet. You see his pain. You see his trepidation. And so you will tell him what you think. What you are about to say may be a turning point in his life. 
Oh, okay. So dispel Nathan's fears. The twins are love for all that exists. Your brother is right. The twins are stern and ruthless. Oh, he's only little. From what I know so far, I'm going to dispel Nathan's fears. Because I think the twins the twins are love for all that exists. It's man that is the, the dickishness. I'm sure the, the twins probably don't give a shit, but I need to... He's going to crumble, otherwise he needs something to hold on to. You tell your brother that the twins are more than just law and will. They also love. So writes Azetius, the disciple of the Elder, and so says Mother. And both you and him were brought into this world through their providence. It is true that their love is quite unlike the love humans have for one another. They cannot forgive others unconditionally like mother or father would. Your parents love you no matter what, but they are unlike them. And yet the twins bear no hatred, for they descended to our world and granted us knowledge of how to live. And this is a great treasure indeed. The twins put us all to the test with the hardships they sent. They watch how we follow our lots. And if Nathan suffers and feels no love for them, then that means they believe in him and know he will endure the suffering. They know he will humbly accept it and let it pass through him. Let it purify him. That is the manifestation of their love. Nathan hangs onto your every word. The despair fades from his face. He's smiling. He puts the chain with the encircled cross back around his neck and hugs you bravely. So, they, they do love me. Thank you. You've helped me hold on to my faith. You hug Nathan back and hear him sniffle on your shoulder. He will remember this little talk for years to come. Oh, sweet little Nathan. Okay. Jesus, adolescence is lasting a while. Agony. Stefan leaves soon after the trial, alone. Grandfather does not go with him. For the first time in a long while, he lingers in the house for more than a fortnight. Father says Sir Gregor is ill and needs to rest. Oh, it would be a real shame if Sir Gregor died. I'd be real sad. Several months go by, and it becomes clear that Grandfather will not recover. The eldest Bronte is mostly bedridden now. On some days, he has trouble recognising people. When he means to address you or Nathan, he calls you Roberts, your father's name. But when he does get out of bed, the house grows empty. The servants hide, mother locks herself in her chambers, you and Nathan run outside or hide quietly in your rooms. If grandfather sees anyone in the hallway, he begins lamenting. Oh, nobody heeds the lots any longer. Any harlot with a child can marry a nobleman these days. Children have no respect, his son betrayed him and let him down. And oh, how the Bronte family has lost its honour. Again and again you hear Grandfather knocking at Mother's door, screaming that it's all her fault. He blames her for ruining his chances to find bliss in the hereafter. He blames her for dooming him to suffer at the foot of the pillar. You overhear your parents talking one night. Mother begs Father to move Sir Gregor to his old home and spare the children his decline. Father refuses her outright. It's late at night. The hot, dry winds are coming. The house is empty, save for you, Nathan, Gloria, Mother, and Grandfather in his bed. Father has left for the capital on business. You're engrossed in the history of the Empire, snapping out of your reverie only when the clock strikes midnight. You blow out the candle and get ready for bed. You hear the shuffling of heavy feet outside your door. You see light in the hallway. Grandfather? What could he want in the middle of the night? You peek into the hallway once he's passed. Grandfather's figure sways as he heads for the door to Mother's chamber. He opens the door and walks in. I don't... I don't like where this is going. You hear him saying something quietly. Your unease is stronger than your fear now. You sneak closer to hear his words. You foul commoner. I need to. I have to cleanse my sins. I have to save my soul, you are my greatest sin, you and what you have done to Robert and this family. 
I should have put a stop to this marriage. I should have stopped Robert from tainting this house with your presence. Why, oh, why didn't I do it? Please, Sir Pronti, I beg of you. Silence! You will do my bidding. Fire will cleanse all lowborn filth from this place. Fire. Fire and flame will free Robert from this disgrace. This is for my son's sake. For my son's sake. For my sake. I need to eradicate this lowborn filth. The twins are calling for me now. I can feel it. I can feel it. I beg of you, please have mercy. Mother begins to cry. You run into the room, unable to stay out of this any longer. Grandfather's gaunt figure looms over Mother's bed, a lit oil lamp in his hand. Mother is sprawled out on the bed, crying. Please, just let me warn the children. I beg of you, Sir Bronte. Your steps are loud enough to be heard. Grandfather turns to look at you. Stay out of this, Nicklaus. Be useful for once. Worldly matters concern me no longer. I see only my sins now, and a sinner I am. A sinner. The twins, they forgive no one. They will judge me by the pillar. I must do something. I don't want to suffer for all eternity. Go away! Mother is crying. Grandfather is still looming over the bed, driven to madness. His hand shakes as it clutches the oil lamp. His eyes shine in the dark. He truly believes this has to be done. You're suddenly torn. What, what if he's right? What if that is the only way for his soul to find salvation? There's no going back now. You have but a moment to act. What? Why? Why would you do that? Why would you? Why would you select this? I'm gonna stop, grandfather. Yeah, obviously. Do not set my mother on fire, please. You look at grandfather defiantly and step towards him. He stares you down with rage and throws the oil lamp at the floor. You manage to catch it, but just barely. Several drops of hot oil hit the rug. Not nearly enough to start a fire. The lamp's glass is blisteringly hot. It burns your hands, but you still hold on to it safely. You low-born scum! You've ruined everything! You're every bit like your mother! You! 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 Enraged, he takes a swing, and you squeeze your eyes shut. But he doesn't hit you. Instead, there's a deep exhalation. You peek at him with one eye, just in time to see him collapse. All his strength is fading away. His chest is heaving, his face a grimace of contempt. Another heavy exhalation. The contempt is gone. There is only fear now. Grandfather's eyes open wide. Almost in surprise, he exhales. His eyes grow dim. Mother is there, whispering a prayer. She's shaking violently. You put the oil lamp gently on the bedside table and call for the servants. They carry the body away. It does not disappear. True death has found him. He will never return. You spend the rest of the night with mother in the sitting room. She will not let go of your hand. For many, many nights afterwards, she keeps seeing grandfather's shadow out the corner of her eye. Well, I, for one, am very, very pleased that that son of a bitch is dead. Father returns from return of the morning after. He is unusually composed as he arranges the funeral. The house becomes quiet, not the looming, heavy sort of quiet of the past few months, but the calm relief you all feel now the crazed old man is no more. At last, Gregor Bronte, the family's patriarch, has departed for the hereafter. Good. He was the worst, honestly just the worst. Your grandfather Sir Gregor Bronte left this world forever to meet the Twin Gods. Whew. Last respects. The night of your grandfather's death shook your family to the core. Yet no matter how it happens, your grandfather, Gregor Bronte, is dead and will never return. He was a fearful shadow looming over the rest of the family, the Bronte patriarch exerting his influence on all the lives below him, and all of you will remember him forever. Father is the new patriarch of the family now, yet he still cannot bring himself to sit at the head of the table where Sir Gregor used to preside. Stefan locked himself away in Grandfather's bedroom every day. He will not talk to anyone. 
Gloria and Nathan still jump at every sound that so much as resembles the knocking of his walking stick. Mother spends all day in prayer at the temple. And yet the house has become calm and quiet with his passing. But there is one more thing that must be done. The final farewell. It weighs heavily upon your soul. The day comes to pay your final respects. Father goes to the tomb alone, save for Stefan, Nathan and you. Mother and Gloria stay at home. Only nobles or those who may become nobles may join this roof. There is a solemn silence as you walk towards the crypt. Father is the one who breaks this silence when he finally reaches the door of the family crypt. Your grandfather built this crypt, and now he will be the first Bronte to remain here in body forever. The first ever noble in our family. It is our duty to now hold the sacrament of flowing blood for Sir Gregor. We will honour his legacy and join him as the founder of the noble Bronte dynasty. Stefan perks up at father's words, his hand still clutching grandfather's sword. Tradition decrees that it must remain in the niche above the owner's sarcophagus. Nathan, on the other hand, looks even more frightened now. Stairs carved of white stone lead you downwards. Deep in the gloom of the crypt, atop the pedestal, you see the sarcophagus that holds grandfather's body. Father takes a moment to compose himself before paying his final respects. Gregor Bronte, my father, brought our family into nobility through his unshakable will. He was a judge and loyal servant to the Empire. He lived his life as if he had been born a noble, and he never strayed away from the path he had chosen. He sought to make the Bronte family ennobled by the sword, so that our children's children might be of noble birth. The twins know I abided by my father's words all my life, even if I could not obey him every time. Father lets off a bitter chuckle as he says this. Stefan glares at father, then turns to glare at Nathan and you. After all, the two of you were born of father's shameful decision to marry a commoner. All of you remember his disastrous passing. He did not die the true death he deserved, yet we all know that he fought for the future he believed in, to the very end. And he will be proud to see his family bid him farewell with the sacrament of the nobility. Stefan still glares at father sullenly. His fingers remain clutched around grandfather's sword. Nathan barely pays attention to the words. He looks around with unease, his arms folded across his chest. Father reaches into his jacket and pulls out a slender dagger, thin and sharp. He takes off his gloves. Watch me carefully, my sons. Make a small cut on the palm of your hand and let the blood flow into this duct on the wall of the crypt. It will join your grandfather's blood here and flow forever. Then ancestor and progeny will become as one. We shall enter our family's blood tide and receive grandfather's final blessing. For his blood flows first in our blood tide. He will respond to you. You are part of him and he is part of you. With a quick motion, father slices his hand and holds the bleeding cuts above a small opening in the wall. Then he hands the dagger to Stefan. Stefan cuts his hand without hesitation and does as father. You receive the dagger next. The dagger's handle feels warm. You hesitate for a moment as you look at the palm of your hand. If you participate in this ritual, you will enter the Bronte blood tide. You, a low-born child. A child who is still a combat. Are you ready to claim your legacy as a descendant of the nobleman Gregor Bronte? The eyes of your father and brothers are upon you. Nathan, the youngest brother, will follow your example. You can be certain of this. No, you can refuse. Interesting. Um, you still recall the first sacrament and how you defied the lash. You are Gregor Bronte's grandson, and so you deserve to enter his blood type. Yeah, I'll bleed. I'll bleed for the old bastard. You remember that fateful day when you were eight. The day when you tried to choose a different lot for yourself. You violated the ritual in the temple, you kissed the sword, and against all odds, you said you had the right to be a noble. And now, you must confirm this right. You must join the Bronte blood tide. You grasp the dagger firmly, then hold the blade to your skin and quickly drag it across your palm. Drops of your blood fall into the duck. 
flowing further into the crypt as they combine with the blood of your father and brother. The fresh wound burns on your hand. What are you doing, Niklaus? Why did we have to take these two long, father? This ritual is for nobles, and you two aren't even noblemen. His eyes meet father's stern gaze. No one is to interrupt the sacrament. He dignants as he is. Stefan falls silent. You hand the dagger to Nathan. The younger brother hesitates. Father offers to help him, but Nathan shakes his head. Finally, he makes a cut, and Nathan's blood joins yours in the duct of the crypt. The deed is done. It is time to close the sarcophagus. The lid falls into place with a heavy, resonant thud. Then, suddenly, you all freeze as each of you hears your late grandfather speak to you. His voice is loud as it rings in the depths of the crypt, and yet he speaks to each of you separately. So you think yourself my descendant, son of a low-born woman? Very well. Time will tell how much nobility you have within. But know this, I am your ancestor. You are my flesh and my blood. I will be watching you always, and my shadow will follow you forever. Do not let me down, boy. Grandfather's voice falls silent. You glance at your father and brothers, astonished. Save for Stefan, everyone else is dumbfounded as well. The ritual is complete. Stefan reverently kisses the grip of Grandfather's sword, and places it in the alcove above the sarcophagus. Once all is done, you leave the crypt together. Cool, fresh wind blows in your face as you return to the surface. Stefan storms off to the carriage, fuming. Father stops halfway to the carriage and hugs Nathan and you briefly. Now your blood belongs to the dynasty of Sir Gregor Bronte as well. Do I have maximum relations with my father? Sounds weird. Good lord, how is this still going? Yep. The fugitive girl. Grandfather's passing and last respects have left a mark on the entire family. His words relayed from the hereafter keep echoing in your mind. You still do your best to avoid the memory of grandfather's last night and spend more time on the city streets with Thomas and your other classmates. The road by the house reminds you of another clash with death. Sometimes, as you walk along the road, you recall Sophia, the beautiful girl with the wonderful eyes, and the terrifying, thundering hooves. You have not seen Sophia since that fateful day. The children who live nearby say her parents sent her to a rich, Arknian family, the Ottons, as the servant. The sun has set. The pillar shines palely in the dark sky. Thomas is ill, so you decide to visit him and tell him the latest news. The streets seem oddly agitated tonight, full of horses, cloaked men, strange faces, and hushed voices. A young nobleman in a heavy, embroidered cloak is walking back and forth, clutching at his sword nervously. There is a grimace of rage on his delicate blue face. He is an arc. You overhear voices. Sir Otten, the girl's not at home. We've searched the house. Her parents swear she ran away from home too. They claim they wanted to bring her back. Just do whatever it takes. Turn this loathsome district upside down if you must. But bring my servant back to me. She's here. Sophia ran away from an ark. How could this be? There's only one place on this entire street where a person can hide. The abandoned Morel house. Four houses away from yours. You head there, doing your best not to attract attention. The lopsided house built out of yellow brick has been abandoned for 20 years or so. You remember playing in here as a boy. You glimpse a figure inside even before you enter. A pair of eyes glimmer in the dark. You would recognise them even after another four years. Sophia has grown up. She's almost an adult now, and her face is full of fear. She's not the easygoing girl next door that you remember. She finally recognises you. Oh, it's, it's you, Niklaus. Be, be quiet, they're all looking for me. I ran away from the youngest Otson. I might be in for lesser death here. But I'd rather die than spend another day in their slavery. I'm just a thing to him, just a toy to play with. Sophia winces and closes her mouth as she says this. There's a glint of bright yellow deep in her eyes. I ran to my parents. I told them all about the men I had to serve. 
and they went and alerted the Ottens. I don't want to be the target of their ire, but you... You aren't going to tip them off, are you? The barking and shouting getting closer, Sophia's voice grows quiet. She runs off to the darkest corner of the house before you can answer. One of the Ossens' servants is so close you can hear the cloak swishing around the ground. He notices something and calls for the others. There are more voices around you now. They approach the house from the yard and surround it. One of them seems particularly snappy, annoyed and impatient. You've already heard his voice today. If you're in there, girl, you'd be wise to come out and quit wasting my time. All will be forgiven, and you will go back where you were. You know it, and if you don't, we'll drag you out by the hair. The hilt of the young Arcanian sword bashes at the door. He is about to lose his patience for good. Sophia hugs the wall in the dark, trying to stay still. She glances at you. What will you do? Your heart is racing. Can you act against Arcanian orders? Do you have the gall to defy the mighty nobleman? Well, I can't do this. Oh, if I'd have saved Sophia, I could have done. But you didn't let me. Well, no, I'm definitely not doing that. Things have become too dangerous. If you're not able to influence the fate of Sophia, I'm going to have to hide. That's literally all I can do. You, sl you swiftly turn away from Sophia's desperate gaze and flee to cower in a dark corner. A pain sigh reaches your ears. I know it. I, what? It was either that or give you up completely. You do not respond. You need to hide. The front door slams open. Heavy footsteps echo from the entrance. The irate Arcanian strides right past your hiding place, paying you no heed whatsoever. Where are you, you little tramp? There's no hiding from me. A shadowy figure streaks past you. Sophia? A high-pitched, furious scream slices through the darkness. A blinding golden flash explodes in front of you. A sudden cascade of sparks burning through the darkness. As you blink, stunned, Otten's tall figure freezes and suddenly collapses. The golden sparks are still dancing before your eyes. A sudden pain seems to rupture your skull from the inside. Through the light and the pain, you barely catch a glimpse of Sophia as she dashes past the prone Arcanian and runs out the door. It takes us on a few long moments to regain his senses. He gets up with a curse and runs after Sophia. Ah, she's a witch too, huh? Get her, now! You hear men running, shouting, and barking orders on the other side of the wall. You lie there on a pile of old bricks, rubbing your eyes. The strange stupor slowly leaves you. You get to your feet and walk unsteadily out of the abandoned house. The danger has passed. You walk back home, lost in thought. So Sophia's a witch. You recall how her magic bound Otten by the arms and legs, how he lost all control of his body. The runaway servant girl becomes the talk of the district for an entire week. You hear that Sophia has managed to flee the city. The Ottens are furious. Sophia vanished from your life just as suddenly as she came. You'll not see her again for quite some time. I wanted to save you twice, and both times I couldn't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I didn't just hand you over, so there's that. You've got to give me some credit for that. You're about to turn 15 just one step away from adulthood. Mother is acting anxious at dinner today, barely touching her food. You exchange glances with Gloria. She carefully tells you more she wants to go to the tailor. Mother shudders, and her hands clenched into fists. No, don't you dare leave home today. I forbid it. That dirty heretic Fotis is preaching his lies under the silver tree today. Twins willing. I don't want you to hear any of it. You and Gloria glance at each other again. Otis, he's a patriarch, the head of the clergy throughout the entire province. That's the first time you've ever heard Mother speak like this about a priest, especially such a high-ranking one. Once you leave the dinner table, Gloria comes to your room with a cunning expression on her face, like she's about to play a trick on someone. She has a plan. Two of you should sneak out of the house and go to the silver tree. You simply must hear the sermon for yourself. What's so bad about patriarch photos? Why does Mother hate him so much? You two are grown-ups now. Surely you have the right to know. You agree with your sister. 
Together you sneak out from under your mother's watchful eye and hurry to the silk tree. The temple block is full of people from all ranks and estates. There's barely enough room for you to squeeze through the crowd. The crowd has gathered around the very roots of the tree. Gloria suggests that you climb up to the roof of the nearby building so you can hear and see everything better. And not a moment too soon. From the roof you see a tall, silver-haired priest step onto the platform by the tree, dressed in a column black robe that looks far beneath his rank. Yet he stands like a noble before the crowd. Behind his back is a banner flapping in the wind, the open book. This is the symbol of the new faith, the crowd whispers. The patriarch holds his hands up to the sky, and the entire temple block grows quiet. He begins his sermon, his vibrant voice rolling across the square. Photis speaks of a great mistake. We entrusted ourselves to the lots as the only way to fulfil divine providence in this world. But for all these years, the will of the twins has been interpreted for us by a single man, Prophet Isaetius. The twins are ever watching from atop the shining pillar. Of this we have no doubt. But how can we so blindly believe that we truly follow their will by following the lots? Have we not seen the three lots of Isaetius fail again and again to answer the question of how we ought to live our lives? Have we not seen people change their lot in life again and again without being smitten by divine wrath? Every person born with a human or Arcnia, lowborn or noble, must find their lot and their way to the gods on their own. From now on, we will seek the gods in the accounts of their own lives, in their own acts in this world, and in their own words as they echo within us. And as we heed the voice of the twins within, we will each find their path for us on our own. The crowd at the Silver Tree listens to the Patriarch's speech in stunned silence. Glance at your sister, her eyes glisten with tears as she hears Foti's words. Then, suddenly, a hoarse cry rises from the crowd. If there are no lots, does that mean the nobles are going to till the fields and the commoners are going to bear arms? The crowd begins to murmur. The Patriarch raises an arm and inhales, ready to answer. An odd figure leaps from the crowd onto the platform. A dirty beggar dressed in rags, a knife flashed in his hands. The blade slices, blood starts spurting from Photus's throat. He slumps over and collapses. A dark brown puddle spreads across the platform where he had stood. Gloria clutches her mouth to suppress a shriek. A few moments of stunned silence, and then the screams begin. The people are frantic. The temple guards try to restore order in the crowd, but to no avail. An old woman dressed in an inquisitor's cassock tries in vain to apply pressure to Patriarch's wounds. The nobles draw their swords. Dogs are barking. The crowd is pushing and shoving. Children are crying. The entire square by the tree is in chaos. From the roof, you see the moment when people start trampling each other. Howling, praying, shouting. Gloria tugs at your sleeve. It's time to go. You climb down from the roof and run. You return home without exchanging a word. Mother has been in her room all the while, so no one notices your absence. Gloria locks herself in her room. You do not discuss the things you've just seen. They're too frightening. But your parents discuss every little detail of the bloodstained sermon over dinner. This is unbelievable. A patriarch murdered in plain sight. The gendarmes and the archduke guards have searched every corner of the slums, and the murderous beggar has disappeared without a trace. I can't even imagine a more gruesome crime. Photis has died a true death, never to return from the hereafter. But, but how? Why can't the Patriarch be reborn? He's so close to the twins. Such is the way of the world, my children. Once you are granted great power by the twins' will, there's no hope for you to come back. Not even after the first of your deaths. Emperors, their powerful vassals, heads of the great Archean dynasties, Patriarchs of the Church, none of them are destined to be reborn. Photus is gone forever. I fear for his soul. It was lost in doubt. Will the twins accept him upon the peak of the pillars? We must pray for the patriarch, children. Let us hope he managed to return to the true old faith before the moment of his passing. But there is little hope for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
The faith is crumbling. Oh, I like it. The last night. Tomorrow, you turn 16. According to Imperial law, you will be a full adult. Your time at Sir Tibor's school has ended. You have studied enough to apply for the Imperial College and learn the judge's trade there. You are to travel to Eterna tomorrow. Your friend Thomas will go there with you to try his luck in the Imperial capital. Mother and father prepare you for the long journey. Remember, son, there is only one goal for you. You must become a student at the Imperial College. Your teachers dragged you through all those books for a reason. You have the knowledge and fervour to be ennobled by the mantle as I was, and as my late father was before. And who knows, maybe one day, you will be the one to write the name Bronte in the Blue Book, and ensure that your children's children will be noble by birth. Then, Mother speaks to you carefully. There is worry in her eyes. But, but Roberts, there may be another path for our son. Stefan, your firstborn, was born a noble. He will surely earn the title for the entire Bronte family. Your second son bears the favour of the twins. For him, the path of the priest is a worthy calling, no less than a nobleman's sword. They have been arguing about your future for a while now. Still, she would never defy the will of a nobleman and her husband. You smile at them both, trying to placate them. Gloria laughs quietly behind their backs. Just don't become a snoot like Stefan, and you'll do just fine. Mother chides Gloria for that. You wink at your sister. Nathan has been downcast all evening. He barely touched his dinner. When everyone gets up from the table, he suddenly rushes over to embrace you. Please don't go, Nick Klaus. Can't you stay? I don't know what I'm going to do without you. You tussle his hair in response. There's no way you can stay now, you say. But when you come home, and you will come home, you'll tell him all the stories and bring him a special present from Eterna. This is it. All your lessons have been learned. All your things have been packed for the road. You will leave the family home tomorrow. Tonight is your last night at home before your departure. You walk through the rooms one last time. The sitting room where Mother used to read you fairy tales. The library where Gloria used to spend all her time. Father's study, which you entered only on special occasions. The backyard where you taught Nathan to build towers one summer. The whole place feels so familiar. So dear to you. It feels like home. You lived here for 16 years. Will you ever return? It's getting late. Everyone's already in their rooms, but you hesitate. Father, mother, Gloria, Nathan. It will be a long time before you see them again. Who will you spend your last few hours at home with? Why? It's mother. Mother? Mummy doesn't love me enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend some time with Gloria. Nathan's okay. He's okay. Indeed, your sister is still awake. She jumps out of her armchair happily the moment she sees you. I'm so happy you're actually here, but You know, before you leave, I actually have something to tell you. Gloria takes your hand and leads you to the library. You light a lamp. Gloria pulls out a hefty volume from one of the shelves. Look, this is the history of noble houses. It's got the story of how humans were first ennobled. I read all of it. Guess what? It didn't happen until after the expansion of the Empire. Apparently there weren't enough Arcanians for all the land, and they just couldn't rule it all by themselves. Arcanians have always treated humans like cattle. But human nobles are even worse. They're like their paltry copies now, bearing noble titles, wearing gem-studded jackets, bossing others around, and poisoning their lives. They make me sick. Everybody says nobles were born to rule, but if you ask me, I say they're nobles. There's nothing noble about demeaning others and living off their hard work. I agree. Gloria is growing unusually agitated. You knew she was not exactly fond of nobles, but this is the first time you've heard such burning scorn in her voice. But then Gloria stops herself suddenly and calms down. I just wanted to tell you, brother, you don't actually have to become a noble. If you're a noble, you have to follow their rules, like Stefan does. You're not like him. I know it. Don't listen to mother, and definitely don't listen to your father. They just want you to blindly follow them. It's true. Sir Bronte spent a lot of money and effort on your education, but a noble title and a judge's rank were his dreams for you, not yours. It's time to think for yourself. Her words spark a dispute. You keep debating into small hours. 
Soon, you both start reaching into history and politics and morals for material, pulling out library books one by one to prove your points. It turns out Gloria is an excellent debater. All the days and nights she spent in the library have honed her mind and rhetorical skills. The sun is about to rise. You should rest before the long trip. But you're not tired at all. But before you return to your rooms, Gloria locks you in a heartfelt hug. Niklaus, please promise me you'll find your own way out there. You nod to her and hug her back, and then she's off. You get into bed, but you can't sleep. Gloria's words keep you up all night. I'm going to find my own way. Don't you worry. You leave the family home for a long time. Your future awaits you in Eterna, the capital of the Empire. The end of adolescence. Last night was your final night at home. The carriage is now waiting at the gates, ready to take you to the capital. The click-clopping of the idle hooves against the cobblestones count the seconds before your departure. You take one more look at your parents' house and recall the childhood spent there, in the nearby yards, at your school, and on the winding streets of Anazot. You clashed with the greater world around you and survived. You felt the tingle of emotion for the first time. You were taught by the school and the streets. You explored the city of your birth and learned something of its past. You witnessed first-hand events that will be remembered by history for all time. All of this is yours now. Forever. You saw death. Lesser death followed by rebirth. And the true death that takes and never gives back. You saw death lying in wait to strike the unaware, like a beast stalking its prey. You saw Grandfather's angry grimace, lit by the flicking fire of the lamp. The Archduke's cavalry trampling those who stood in their way your older brother's bloody sword slicing through the air. Death has followed you from a very young age. And yet, you live on. You have a friend who's been by your side all these years. Thomas taught you many things. How to take a hit, how to keep your word, and how to remain true to your own self. And now Thomas is walking to the same carriage as you are, with a heavy bag slung over his shoulder. Your friend will remain your companion for the time being. There's going to be some issues down the, down the line there, isn't there? Ahead of you is a long trip towards the capital and the Dole. For the first time, you will be away from your family and home. What awaits you in the future? Whew. This has been a long one. I've been recording for like two and a half hours. My voice is going to hurt tomorrow. Okay, so honourable, bright, soulful. Nah, this is just, like, never going anywhere. Still untouched by death. Which is something. Okay. So we are done. We are done with chapter two. Moving on to chapter three. Hopefully you have enjoyed listening to my voice for the last two and a half hours. Or however long this video ends up being. Yes, and we will jump into chapter three in the next video. But... If you want to check this out for yourself, then the link to the game page is in the description. If you have any thoughts on anything to do with this, then let me know. Leave me a comment and we can discuss. Thank you very much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, then why don't you go ahead and <laughs> the like button. The best years of your life that is the subscribe button. Make sure you are bad boy. And until next time, love you, man.